After more than two decades on the air in Cleveland, reporter and news anchor Ramona Robinson is still making headlines. Her recent memoir, A Dirt Road to Somewhere, is a testimony to the path she's traveled. Now you were the first African American woman to uh, anchor an evening newscast in Cleveland. What did that honor mean to you back then and what does it mean to you now? Sounds like I'm ancient. No, it? it does not. <laughs> no, I actually could not believe when I came to Cleveland in 1988 mm -hmm. and they told me I would be the first um, African American woman to anchor a primetime evening show. I was actually shocked because I just assumed, mm -hmm. you know, when you look at Cleveland's demographics right. that they had had someone in that role before. But it was such an honor for me, and it was, I remember, a frightening time for me as well. And you know, um, women entered the business in the mid-80s. There was an influx of women, not just blacks, but whites as well. And there was some pushback with some males, not all, yeah. but with some males who didn't want to share the anchor desk with women. Mm -hmm. And so, um, unfortunately, I felt the wrath of some of that. And even when I came to Cleveland, um, what should have been one of the most joyous moments in my life, because finally I've realized my dream. I'm an evening anchor in a top 20 market. Um, you know, unfortunately, I was met with, with hate uh, in the beginning by, um, I received so many horrible, ugly letters from people who said they were members of the Ku Klux Klan and, you know, we have beautiful white anchors, we don't need N anchors like you. Go back where you came from. And and I, I, I'm such a crybaby. <laughs> and I remember going into my news director's office. Every time I came in with one of those envelopes, he knew uh, it was one of those letters and he kept a box of tissues on his desk and he'd oh. hand me the oh, tissue no. because he knew I was going to cry and he was like, why don't they like me? And I've worked so hard to mm -hmm. get here. And, and I just remember, and I talk about this in my book, the conversation he had with me when my mom was feared for my life and she wanted me to leave Cleveland oh, and gosh. come home. And I said, no, mom, I can't run. I'd worked for this moment because my idol was Walter Cronkite. And I was like, no, this is my dream. I'm not gonna let people run me out of this community. And my faith is, is so strong. I just had to talk to God and pray every night. And, you know, God led me to, to stay. So there were no moments you were like, I, I got to go or I don't know if I can do this anymore. There were some moments because, you know, remember, I felt like I had the weight of the world on my shoulders. Okay. I didn't want to disappoint the African-American community who had uh, fought for this to happen, to have more black representation in television news. And also there was the white community that I felt like I needed to prove, even though I had the education, the background, the experience, I still felt this need that I had to approve that I earn this position. And so all of that was playing into my psyche. And yet I had my mom pulling me to come back home. And once I decided, no, I'm not gonna run. I'm gonna stay and stand here in this moment. I deserve this, I've worked for it. The outpouring of love and support, just I'll never forget the first group, uh, the um, Irish Americans in um, North Olmsted uh, called me up and said, hey, we know you're new. Uh, we have an Irish festival every year. Why don't you come out and see what we do? And, and so I went out. That's the first time I danced the Irish jig. Oh <laughs> and poorly, I might add. <laughs> and, uh, but it, it just goes to show you that when you push past the hate and you allow the love to come in, mm -hmm. the Lord literally poured me out a blessing that I would not have room enough to receive it. But this isn't your original home. Where did you grow up? Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up in the backwoods of rural uh, poverty stricken Missouri. And uh, it was a town called Wilson City, Missouri, population 212, 12 being my family. <laughs> I know. Every time I drive in, population 212, it's like, hey, that 12 is my family. Um, but I grew up um, not having a lot um, as a kid, and I think that made me appreciate um, when I did work really hard and I was able to um, acquire all the things that I, I wanted as a child. I remember 
I talk about this also in the book, going to school at one point with shoes that were much too small. I mean, just imagine during this interview if you wore a size, you know, eight and you're, you're in a size six, <laughs> how your feet would feel. And I would go to school like that and I couldn't concentrate in school because my feet hurt so much. And so um, I went without so much and, you know, fast forward, um, when I went into my closet this morning to pick out a pair of shoes, I had to think about what pair do I want to wear because there are rows and rows and rows of, of shoes. And I never forget from where I came because there was a time when there was just one pair and that pair had holes in them and they were too small. And so um, I think that's the thing that made me want to share and give back all that God has blessed me with. Because when you, when you struggle, I look at the world today, right now I, I think statistics show that uh, suicide is up amongst uh, ninth grade girls and anxiety and depression mm -hmm. is just um, something that they deal with each and every day. Um, I understand those pressures to fit in, even though we didn't have social media back mm -hmm. then. There, there is huge pressure with these kids. They look at Instagram and they, they feel like they don't you know, measure up to other kids. And it's literally depressing <laughs> our kids. You talk about your mom. Everything I've read about her sounds like she was an amazing woman. She passed away last year, right? Yes. Um, she was a single mom, 11 kids, and put nine of you through college. Yes, right? she did. Do, is that where you got a lot of your motivation from? Oh, was it my, her? My mom was my strength, my rock. I mean, she, for a woman who grew up uneducated, uh, all she ever talked about was education, education, mm -hmm. and um, that the fact that we were required to graduate <laughs> high school and go to college. And if you didn't go to college, you had to get mm -hmm. a training and something to be able to take care of yourself. And she used to always, we called it preaching, but she'd walk up and down our hallway saying, you know, I want a better life for you than I had. And so um, education was, was our way out of poverty. I mean, she grew up in a family, generation after generation, poverty was cyclical. And she knew the only way to break that cycle was to get an education. And so, you know, that's what we did. We went to school, we got an education, and um, every child, once you graduated college and you started to make money, you sent money back home for the, to help with the other kids. And that's, that's how we did it. That's how we helped each other out of uh, poverty. She goes, Ramona, I have a great assignment for you today. And I said, wonderful, what is it? And she said, the Ku Klux Klan is having a rally here in Charleston, and I'm sending you to cover it. What's going through your mind? I'm terrified, and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, this is gonna be it. I'm gonna be killed today. When did you know you wanted to be a journalist? When did you know you wanted to be an anchor? I was six years old. I, being a middle child, and my mom worked a lot because she was adamant that she would not go on welfare, even though people told her she probably should. She was adamant and she always said, I birthed you in the world, it's my job to take care of you. Mm -hmm. And so she worked sometimes one, two jobs. She was, her main job, she was a seamstress at a local wow. shoe factory making four to six dollars an hour. And because I was the middle child, I never really got a lot of attention. It was, she was always worried about the baby or worried about the oldest one who was trying to sneak out mm -hmm. to date. <laughs> so, and there was me, the good kid. My sisters hate when I say this, but I was the good girl, did everything I was supposed to do, got good grades, came home. You didn't have to pressure me to do my homework. I went to do it. And one, but I missed my mom. And so one of the things I noticed, every single evening, the house had to be quiet at six o'clock because she had to watch the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite. Mm -hmm. And so I would ease up around her to see who was this man that she was engrossed with, that we had to be so quiet. And so I remember crawling up in her lap and watching the news with her. 
and I just became hooked. All of the, and you know, I was a kid in the late 60s, so all of the the turbulent news that was going on back then. I would see, you know, police with billy clubs, you know, beating people in the street, arresting people. I would see um, fires, you know, riots, and and I was engrossed in it. And and even though I was young, my mom didn't try to shield me from it. She she explained to me what was going on in the world, and and. I just, every day I had to have it. She didn't even have to call me to tell me the news. <laughs> Some days I told her, Mom, it's time for Walter Cronkite. And at six years old, I came home, declared to my mom, start saving for college. I'm gonna be just like Walter Cronkite. Yeah. And she looked down at me and, and said, you know what that means. You gotta continue to get good grades and go to college. And I know at that point she probably had no idea how she would ever send me to college, mm -hmm. but she encouraged me every single day. And one of the things I have to say about my mom is at 68 years old, my mom went back to school and got her GED. What? At 70 years old, she entered college and majored <laughs> in computer science. Computer science. <laughs> computer science. <laughs> and it's like, she called me in Cleveland saying, Ramona, I need you to help me with my homework. And I was like, mom, why do you think I majored in journalism? <laughs> I can't help you. So yeah, she practiced what she pre preached. She always wanted a college degree. What an amazing woman. Yeah, she was, uh, she was something else. So you went to school. What would, how did you get your foot in the door? What was your first job? Oh my goodness. You know, kids, I tell kids this and their eyes get so big <laughs> and wide um, because all of our lives, adults tell us, go to school, get an education. You'll be able to graduate and get a job, right? Mm -hmm. Wrong. <laughs> I could, not for most of us. I must have gone to 15 interviews and could not get a job. I would hear everything from you have no experience. And I was like, well, yeah, how can I get it if you don't give me a job? I would hear your voice is awful. And you know, that can be really discouraging for a young graduate. Sometimes you think, okay, I'm not gonna get a job. I'm not good enough because these news directors said it. No, you have to believe in yourself. And for me, it was believing that God had not brought me this far to just drop me off and say, you're done. Mm -hmm. And so I was determined that I was not going to accept no for an answer. And there was one place I avoided going. And that was the country radio station in Jefferson City, Missouri. And I didn't go because I listened to my peers. Okay. My peers said to me, don't even bother. They don't hire black personalities. You'll never get a job there. And so I listened because I thought, okay, they're not going to hire me. And here was this, what I believe to be the voice of God saying, you go in there armed with your degree and your resume and you apply for a job. And just my luck that day, the music director was in, interviewed me and offered me a job. Wow. And so I tell kids all the time, sometimes your friend's truth may not be yours. And I know it's scary sometimes, but you've got to push past the fear and go for what you know. My girlfriend told me one of the local television stations had a reporter job opening. And when she told me it was a CBS affiliate, I thought, they are, he is not going to hire me. That was the guy who I thought was extremely harsh. And so I called and to my surprise, the secretary said, he'll speak to you. And he says, so Ramona, I noticed you've been working on your voice. And I was like, you have? How do you know that? He said, I wake up every morning at 5.30 a.m. and you're on my favorite radio station. So, so <laughs> yes. So you see the, the full, cyclical, uh, the full yeah. um, circle moment? Mm -hmm. Had I not gone in to apply for the radio job, the man who said I was awful and should get out of the business would not have been listening to know that I had been working on my voice and I was improving. So he called me in and uh, I got the job. Persistence. Yeah. Absolutely. And I'm, fearlessness. I'm dogged when it comes, <laughs> especially when you tell me I can't do something. Yeah. One of the hardest things for me, I think, was um, going through the loss of children. My husband and I tried in vitro fertilization four times and, um, you know, only to have those pregnancies fail.
so you've had to look evil straight in the eye because one of your early assignments in South Carolina was you had to go to a KKK rally <laughs> and you were supposed to go up to the Grand Dragon <laughs> and interview him. Yes, can you imagine? So um, South Carolina, my stint there, don't get me wrong, the people there in Charleston were wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, the city is gorgeous and I loved working in the city and Again, this was in the mid 80s when a lot of blacks were entering the business. And um, one of the managers there just did not like me. And one morning when I came in, she was so friendly and cordial. I'm thinking, oh, we've turned the corner, right? And she goes, Ramona, I have a great assignment for you today. And I said, wonderful, what is it? And she said, the Ku Klux Klan is having a rally here in Charleston, and I'm sending you to cover it. And so I'll never forget my white colleagues who were so, who were so embarrassed. They just started typing really <laughs> fast on their keyboards they, because they could not believe uh, I'm the only black reporter and she's sending yeah. me to the Klan rally. What's going through your mind? I'm terrified because I had only seen the Klan in history books or in the movies. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, this is going to be it. I'm going to be killed today. You know, and so she said, and as I get up to, to walk out with my photographer, and she said, by the way, one more thing, the Grand Dragon will be there. I want you to walk up to him and get me an interview. And now my heart is really beating like it's going to come out of my chest because I'm thinking, I know I'm not going to survive this. Mm -hmm. And I remember my photographer, who was a, a wonderful white gentleman, as I uh, reached for the door to get out, he grabbed my hand and he said, Ramona, I can tell you are terrified. He said, I tell you what, you stay here in the car, you lock the door, I will go out there, I'll interview the Grand Dragon, and I won't tell anyone you didn't do the story. Okay. I, <laughs> right? Right? So I wanted to say, okay, I'll see you when you get back, but you know, the journalist in me just would not allow mm -hmm. that. And so I said, no, I've been given an assignment, well, let's go. And I just remember walking toward um, the Klan, and um, I'm not going to give it away because you'll have to read the book. <laughs> but you did interview him? I did interview him. And so when you look back at some of your first assignments when you were starting out, what were some of the experiences that really stand out to you? What do you think helped shape you? I think what, um, you know, I loved great storytelling. That was first and foremost, and delivering news that could actually help people. But one of the things I noticed when I first came to Cleveland in 1988 was, um, all of the news regarding our kids was negative. Mm -hmm. I mean, we showed pictures of kids being arrested for murder and for rape, robbery, and, you know, truant kids and kids getting pregnant. And the news was so negative, it was as if we were saying to our kids, the only way to make television news is to do something negative. And I hated that because I was crisscrossing the region, going to all these different schools, some of the poorest districts to some of the wealthiest districts, and I found good kids doing the right things, trying to, to uh, make lives better, not just for themselves, but volunteering, helping other people. And I remember going back to my news director saying, I want to showcase these kids. And at the time, you know, it was the, the mantra, if it bleeds, it leads. Yep. And so it was all, you know, blood and guts. And, <laughs> and my colleagues were saying, you know, good kids and good people doing good things. No one wants to hear about that. Right. And my news director said, if that's what you want to do, great, let's do it. And so 30 years later, um, believe me when I tell you, Lindsay, there isn't a place I don't go where at some point people will say, I love what you do with the kids. I feel even myself as a journalist, that this career has truly made me a better person with being touched by people like that. Yeah. Do you feel it made you a better person as well? Definitely. I always loved um, children. Mm -hmm. One of the hardest things for me, I think, was um, going through the loss of children. My husband and I tried in vitro fertilization four mm -hmm. times and, um, you know, only to have those pregnancies fail. But 
it's it's amazing what God will do for you when you're in a deep depression and despair. It was actually one of my Ramona's kids that who helped to pull me out of it. Really? Yeah, because um, you know God didn't allow me to birth my own children, but born was my Ramona's kids, and and I'll never forget. I had switched stations and gone across the street from the NBC to the CBS affiliate, and one of my Ramona's kids um, emailed me, messaged me on Facebook, and she said, Miss Robinson, we, we know you've left Channel 3 and we're not sure you know, if you're gonna stay in town. I just wanna ask you to please stay, don't leave Cleveland, because us kids, we need you, um, and you're always present and your encouragement means so much. And, and it was like one of those aha moments. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I still can be a nurturer and encourage other kids who aren't my own yeah. because I'm, I'm needed in that way. And so that, that made me snap out of that trance <laughs> that I was then saying, whoa, it is me. But it was understandable why you were feeling so low. I mean, and infertility is a, something that affects so many women, so many couples. What would you say to any couple that might actually be watching and they're going through the same thing right now? Be grateful mm -hmm. that you have the opportunity to have people who love you and surround you. And um, if do adoption is an option for you, then you know consider that. But um, bitterness, that, that's never a good thing. You've had a number of life obstacles. What else do you talk about in your book that you would like for people to take something away from? Well, I think my book is resonating with people, especially women, because mm -hmm. um, they can relate to all of the things I've gone through in the book. I talk about having a, a bad relationship, you know, staying stuck in a relationship when you know you should get out of it. Mm -hmm. But fear, fear will keep you stuck yes. and you have to be able to trust God and know that there's something better for you. I talk about a, a boyfriend who, um, he was my fiance. We had practiced our vows in sickness and in health and how when I was sick, he left me there bleeding on the floor so that he could stay out with another woman until 5.30 a.m. And it was that moment I lay there by myself thinking, you are a beautiful college educated woman and you're gonna sit here and allow someone to treat you like that. And it, it was me who had to recognize, I could blame him all day, but I had decided to allow that and to allow that treatment Women know, we all know, we get in those situations where we feel like there is no way out, but he has always seen me through the bad times.